Hi, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so thanks again, Dr. Chawla and uh, Dr. Jaggi for the invitation. And um, before I heard the excellent session just before me, and I completely agree with uh, Dr. Sheshadri that we need to go back to basics to understand really physiology of medicine. And um, so today I'm going to talk about twin proteins, which is very exciting new class of uh, medications which we use for, which will be frequently used in, for treatment of type 2 diabetes. Again, we know this drug works, but we don't know exactly how it works. So I gave the talk on ingredients before last year. So I tried to focus more on mechanism of action, how this class of drugs work. Okay, so let me share my screen. Let me start with a case. So this is a patient we have seen in my own clinic. So he's like a 53 middle-aged man who has a long-standing history of type 2 diabetes. He's on high dose of insulin, total about 120 units per day. He's also on empagliflozin and metformin. And he has a history of heart disease and hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He had multiple stents. And he wants to achieve better glycemic control, but he's concerned that he's gaining too much weight. So these are his labs. His A1C is 8%. He has CKD. And uh, so what are the treatment options? So what can we do for him to so that he achieves better control without gaining weight? So one option is to increase the insulin. But again, you gain weight. DP for inhibitors, there's a very modest effect on glycemic control, lower C1C by 0.3 to 0.4 percent. And pure glutathione, he has heart disease and questionable history of heart failure, so may not be a good idea. So GLB-1 agonist will definitely be a good, better choice for him. So, so we actually, he participated in a clinical trial in which he was uh, started in a GLP-1 agonist. About a year later, uh, when I, I follow him every three months, his A1C has gone down from 8.1% to 5.9%, and is no longer an insulin, and he has lost about 50 pounds, so about 20 kilograms. His GFR is stable. What do you think? Which GLP-1 agonist was person of A1C or weight in any other class of medication? Which lost about uh, and normalized A1C and no longer insulin and lost about 50 pounds. So these are the guidelines. Basically, patient with pre-existing heart disease, those with atherosclerotic heart disease, GLP-1 agonist is preferred. Those with uh, heart failure, SGLT2 inhibitor is preferred. So even in US, this is data based on an uh, analysis of insurance claim-based data from 2018 to 19, although now it will be different. Uh, which analyzed the data on patient type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Uh, how many of them are getting guideline-based recommended treatment? And it was surprising to see that even in a country like US, about 38% were not on any guideline-based therapy like statin, AC inhibitor, ARB, and SGLT2 or GLP-1 agonist. Only 40% were on one evidence-based therapy, and only 20% I had were on two evidence-based therapy. So within though we create these guidelines in the real world, we do not follow through, and not every patient is ideally everybody should be on the guideline-based treatment regimen, but they do not, it does not happen in the real world. So we all know the physiology of GLP and agonists. I think I should skip. They all increase insulin secretion in a glucose-dependent manner, and they work on satiety, the decrease, uh, increase satiety and reduce A1C by 1 to 1.5 percent. However, this new class of GLP-1 agonists actually decrease it more than by 2 percent, and they lead to significant weight loss. And several GLP-1 agonists have shown additional cardiovascular renal out improvement benefits in cardiovascular renal outcomes too. So, but the potential limit is now we know that GLP-1 agonists to work. But there's significant GI side effect like nausea and vomiting, which limit the therapeutic potential. If you can increase the dose and give them higher or more sustained effect of GLP-1, we'll see a better effect on glycemic control as well as weight loss. So one strategy is to combine or use the GLP-1 as a foundation. And on top of that, you add another compound, which has targeted other pathways like on adipocytes, like you just heard about Dr. Um, about adipocyte inflammation. So if you combine this with another drug which works in the adipocyte or improves adipocyte sensitivity and decreases adipocyte inflammation, that will helpful or increase the therapy and also uh, in, in, increase the efficacy of this class of medications. So 
That's the goal to combine GLP-1 receptor with another class of agent which works on lipid metabolism and may also affect in improving weight loss and insulin sensitivity. So one obvious choice is GIP, but GIP was kind of like a step child. Not many people worked on GIP because we know that GIP is a secret from K cells and in response to mostly fat in the meal, fat and carbohydrates. And in healthy subjects, uh, GLP also, GIP like GLP causes uh, glucose dependent insulin secretion. But it is GIP, the endogenous GIP actually accounts for about 70% of the endogenous in proteins. So and it was the first uh, in protein which was discovered. And GIP receptors are also present in adipose, unlike GLP-1, which is not, there are no GLP-1 receptors in the adipose tissue. And um, the other difference is the effect on glucagon. I'll come to it in a bit. Just to give an historical perspective, as I told, GIP was the first uh, in protein discovered in the 1970s. And then uh, in 1980s, it was shown that when you infuse GIP to type 2 diabetics, did not do anything. There was no effect on glycemic control. That's why everybody almost kind of gave up on working on GIP agonist. And um, then subsequently, DP4 was discovered in 1990s. In 2000, it was shown that if you infuse GIP along with GLP-1 in you know, animal models in improves glycemic control, then 2010s onwards, it was shown that combined GLP-1 and GIP uh, relate to weight loss. And there was improvement in glycemic control combined GLP, GIP, and type 2 diabetic patients. Now, what the, why there was no GIP uh, agonist study in the past? Because it was shown that GIP levels are normal in type 2 diabetes. In fact, in obesity, it can be high. So there is basically resistance to GIP, unlike GLP. Or GLP levels may be low or slightly normal, maybe normal in type 2 diabetes. But in few GLP-1, it lowers, it causes insulin secretion and lowers glucose level. How, if you infuse GIP, you do not see such an effect. And uh, so there is a, a theory that probably a GIP resistance is due to the glucotoxicity. If somehow you can ameliorate the glucotoxicity by intensive treatment of the insulin, you can restore the sensitivity to GIP. And in animal models, the data earlier studies were contradictory. It's not sure whether one should target for GIP agonists or GIP antagonist, because the data in either way that's showing GIP agonist is good or GIP antagonist is also good. So that's for those GIP receptor agonists were not being pursued earlier till a few years back. Our recent studies stored that overexpression of GIP led to weight loss and improved glycemic control. And if you lose, if you delete the uh, some of the release of GIP receptor, led to type 2 type dysphenotype and combined GLP, GIP, infusion sent effective. But you know, in real world, it's not practical to give two separate injections of GIP and GLP-1. So therefore, the goal was to develop a molecule which has both GLP and GIP together and see if it is effective, uh, can be used for type 2 diabetes. And it showed to compare and contrast the effect of GLP and GIP. They both work on central nervous system, both in satiety, cause weight loss, and to decrease caloric intake. And the main difference is that GLP-1 agonist causing GLP causes increased nausea, whereas GIP actually attenuates the GLP-1 induced nausea. So if you combine GLP and GIP, you'll see that uh, you can increase the dose of GLP-1 without you know, significant GI side effects. The other main difference is glucagon, right? Uh, GLP-1 inhibits glucagon secretion, particularly in hypoglycemic and euglycemic condition, whereas GIP actually increases glucagon concentration, particularly in hypoglycemic events. Some studies shown even in hyperglycemic concentration, GIP may increase glucose. Other major difference between GLP and GIP is that there is no GLP-1 receptor adipose tissue. GLP-1 does not have an effect on adipose tissue directly. It does not have insulin sensitivity directly, whereas GIP was initially discovered as a major effect on adipose tissue. It increases storage of um, dietary lipids and adipose tissue or expansion of healthy adipose tissue, it has somehow, it resembles that of a thiazolid in an or a PPR gamma agonist, increases adipose tissue insulin sensitivity, glucose uptake, and improves lipid buffering capacity. So that's a major difference between GLP and GIP. So what are the new therapeutic approach for treating metabolic diseases? So we know that there's redundancy on physiology in normal healthy human beings for control of blood, for example, or satiety. 
There are several hormones which regulate satiety. So if you block, try to block one particular pathway, there's compensatory increase in other pathways so that that defect is negated. So goal is to try to approach uh, with multiple target at the same time. And we can use multiple hormones at the same time, which is not practical, or you can try one molecule, single molecule, which acts on several receptors. The benefits of this hybrid molecules, which is like GLP, GIP, or GLP and glucagon, is that they are for key metabolic benefits of each constituent hormone, like certain, for example, GLP and GIP. While upsetting negative side effects, you can design the molecule in such a way that you upset the side effects of each individual separately. The other advantage is they have single pharmacokinetic profile. It's not like a poly pill, you combine three different medicines in one pill, but this will have a single pharmacokinetic profile. And they have the potential of multiple targets and multiple effects of the single target organ. So showing schematic different examples, like one is GLP and glucagon coagonist, they can combine both act on both GLP and GIP glucagon receptor. The GIP and GLP1 agonist, that's the trisipatide, and GLP, GIP, and glucagon agonist. So you can combine all three and see a synergistic effect on body weight, glycemic control, and body weight and glycemic control. So sure. now the structure of the GLP-1 and glucagon and oxyndamodulin, these are three derived from the same pre-proglucagon, but they, there is significant structural similarity between these three compounds, whereas GIP is totally different. This is 30 amino acid, this is 42 amino acid. This is the first... Uh, Polyagonist, not to indicate in this polyagonist, GLP1 and glucagon, the first one to be described. And this is the GLP and GIP. And this is the first twin protein discovered by Matthias Schaub's group in um, 2013. Uh, and there's a, I'll show the data soon. And this is the pegylated version of the same uh, first GLP and GIP uh, agonist. And here's the structure of uh, native GLP1, native GIP1, which is 40 dominant, and egg. And, exen and exenatide is the first GLP-1 approved for it, uh, first in creatine approved for use in type 2 diabetes. This is this hepatitis. It's, it's about 39 amino acids. It has four amino acid system, which resembles GLP-1, nine resembling GIP, and 10 has common to both GLP and GIP, and 10 common to both account to it, like exendine. So, and actually, this hepatitis is basically based on the GIP structure. The first animal data using a GLP twin protein in animal models. The first set of slides showing uh, data showing compared to exendin uh, GLP1 agonist. There's the bottom set of slide, uh, figures showing effect combining with respect to liraglutide. So compared to liraglutide, if you use this GLP GIP coagonist in animal models, showing there is much greater weight loss compared to liraglutide. The one in red is liraglutide. One blue is Again, the GLP GIP coagonist. And there's decreased food intake, the fat mass goes down, and the blood glucose. So there's these combined, the twin protein was more effective than GLP1 agonist alone in animal models. And um, the same study, the same compound when used in humans for the first time showed that this the study in which what they did, they gave the injection of polyagonist or the GLP GIP agonist, and then after how much glucose you need to maintain your glycemia. The less glucose you need, that means the more effective the drug is. As you can see, the higher doses of this compound is more effective than placebo. Or, and it's because this compound causes marked increase increasing insulin secretion. So however, this compound never saw the light of the day because when compared in type 2 diabetes, this particular compound, glp agonist, was not found to be very effective superior to liraglutide in terms of weight loss and A1C control, particularly in patients who have high A1C. And those are lower A1C, this compound works. So some of this compound didn't work, work very well, although this was the first GLP GIP agonist. This hepatite, however, on the other hand, is a newer um, poly GLP GIP agonist. It has more like a native GIP, half life of five days. And so in terms of basic signs in the Studies have shown that you know both GLP and GIP they act the pancreatic beta cells by increasing cyclic AMP production. So you can measure the cyclic AMP response by work, uh, examining the effect of this drug in cells. You need to have GLP and GIP receptor. Then you measure how much cyclic AMP is produced, and shown that is equivalent to native GIP production of cyclic AMP. 
whereas it is 5 for lower binding epinephrine, 20 for lower cyclic AMP products compared to native GLP-1. So it's, it resembles more like a GIP. And this is the first human phase 2B studies in, with using tizepatide. And based on this study, there's so much excitement because of the, you can see the degree of improvement in glycemic control. The red is the dulaglutide, and then these are tizepatide, this 5 milligram, 10 milligram, 15 milligram. So 2.4 percent lower in A1C, and about 11.3 kilograms weight loss compared even much higher than that. Come another GLP-1 agonist that's dulaglutide. So I think I should skip the individual trial. There have been so many trials showing that essentially they are showing that A1C loss that mean A1C becomes 5.8 percent with higher doses of uh, tizepatide. That's almost like a normal glucose tolerance, and uh, the fasting glucose level, there's marked decline in fasting glucose levels. There's also improvement in lipid profile. And as you can see, the weight loss, 15% weight loss with uh, tizepate 50 milligram, and which was much higher than almost double that of a semaglutide 1 milligram. They did not compare with semaglutide 2.4 milligram, but with compared to semaglutide 1 milligram, this is superior. And it was equally effective in both patients who are low A1C less than 8.5%, and those were eight, more than 8 and almost completely normalized that 24-hour glucose profile. And the adverse events um, is as much higher in the initial phases of treatment. That's the goal is to go start low and go slow. We titrate 2.5 milligram every four weeks, and that way you can see the over a period of time, the side effects decline. So this compound is definitely effective than semaglutide. And... Uh, has also additional effect on beneficial effect, beneficial effect on triglyceride and HDL cholesterol. I think I should just skip this. This is all. There are several studies, so it was two, three, and four. One compared semaglutide, then they compared with the insulin deglutide, then one compared with the insulin glargin. And this is the on patient with type 2 diabetes cardiovascular risk factor. So show that it does not improve, but there is no increased risk of cardiovascular events with third tizepatide. Again, the same study, they showed that on the 15 milligram dose had a slightly lower mass cardiac four point mass event, but again, the event rates are so low that one can, cannot conclude any effect on cardiovascular endpoints based on this study. And this is for non diabetic obese subjects. Again, it showed that um, this is the first drug in its class showing 20% weight loss. I don't think any other drug has this much weight loss in non diabetic obese subjects. And um, most of the patients reach the target. Uh, everybody reached more than 4%, 5% weight loss. So this drug also has a potential for use in NASH and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, seeing all the markers of NASH, so also significant improvement, ALT, ASD. Okay, now cardiovascular risk factors also decline significantly. For example, CRP, ICAM-1, and leptin. Okay, this is the summary of all uh, surpassed trials. Again, consistently showing that A1C improvement about 2%. It varies from 2 to 2.5% higher dose of tisipatide. And this is regardless of the duration of diabetes, age of the patient, the younger versus age, or longer, short duration of diabetes. And consistently showing more than 2% weight loss and 2% improvement in A1C. And body weight decline is about... Um, 10 to 15 percent, and in non diabetic obese percent, the weight loss can reach up to 20 percent. And although we, we expect that there will be no side effect or decrease, but it's kind of the side effect as compared to other GLP 1 agonists, no, it's not higher. So, about 10 to 15 percent, 10 percent patient may discontinue study medical because of the adverse event. Now, the thing is that how these drugs work, we don't know. We have to still do a lot of basic science, basic studies to see exactly how, whether this is just because of pure GIP agonism through GIP receptor, or is GIP enhances the effect of GLP-1, or whether GLP-1 sensitizes the GIP receptor, we don't know. So one theory is that improved glycemic control GLP-1 receptor restores the sensitivity to GIP, because we know that to improve glycemic control, once the dose levels come down, so GIP can work better. And other theory is that GIP enhances the lipid buffering capacity, or it works primarily on adipose tissues. So there's a synergistic effect with GLP-1. It works like a thiazolidine in that. And then there's a synergistic because both GLP-1 and GIP act on the centrally, leading to weight loss. And um, the other thing is that the GIP continues with the GLP-1-mediated uh, adverse events like nausea, 
that's so improved so it could be that this is just a very strong glp1 agonist act like strong glp1 agonist or it is the gip which is more important so right now this there are several studies going on which try, what people are trying to do is you block the effect of gip then you block the glp1 see which one is more plays a more important role in mediating the effect of tizipatide so and uh, one theory is also there is that is whether it's purely it can be everything can be explained because of weight loss but there's some weight independent effects and uh, I'll, i'll skip this one there's a study in animal models so that gi tizipatide actually has a weight independent insulin sensitizes animal models now this is the first human study which looked at a mechanistic effect on beta cell function and insulin sensitivity this was done in germany a small study about 45 percent assigned to semaglutide and 45 to tizipatide which was recently published they had a a1c of 8 percent they all participated in a, a euglycemic uh, hyperinsulin clamp followed by uh, this is the study design so first they had 80 million per meter square euglycemic insulin clamp this followed by after two hours the same day they produced they had a hyperglycemic insulin and so this was to determine the insulin muscle insulin sensitivity this one for the beta cell function so here the disposition index which is the product of its sensitivity and insulin secretion as baseline they all groups are comparable disposition rate, but after about 6 months this is semaglutide this also improved but there's much greater improvement in beta cell function with tizipatide and showing the first phase this is the first ten minutes the first phase insulin response was greater with uh, tizipatide the second phase and this is the arginine stimulating insulin secretion which is also higher with tizipatide and again showing the first this is the first phase insulin response was higher second phase was higher and the glucose infusion required the higher the mean glucose or the greater the glucose amount amount of glucose you need to maintain your glycemia the more insulin sensitive you are so the tizipatide group group required much more glucose is they're more sensitive so the m value which is the glucose infusion rate again was showing that is much higher So this is the first study to show that semaglutide um tizipatide is superior to semaglutide in skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity they improved there's a greater improvement in beta cell function and also I can show you the data there also led to greater suppression of plasma glucagon uh, even though this despite gip being there there's a greater suppression of gi uh, plasma glucagon in tizipatide and the adverse events were comparable to that of semaglutide so GLP and GIP they act as synergistic effect. They both work on insulin sensitivity and pulse secretion, and particularly GIP improves triglyceride clearance. They both work on satiety. GIP is inhibits lipolysis and ventricular contaminatory risk. We do not know the effect of uh, GIP, but GLP one slightly acts on these effects, and the decreased glucagon secretion, the decreased gastric emptying, emptying, and appetite. They both. combined work on this ectopic fat deposit is most likely gip works for this and hepatic glucose production most likely gip or something so what are the other polyagonists these are not in pet in doing pet in again there's other polyagonists um, i'll show you some data on glp and glucagon and glp gip and glucagon and there's this both are compounds um, glp uh, glucagon glp and gip glucagon i'm being pursued by lady and glp1 amyl actually there's this we are just starting a trial on semaglutide plus something called triglyceride which is amyl analog and there are other future uh, other compound proposals for glp1 estrogen glp dexamethasone you were surprised that we can think about using a dexamethasone for treatment of obesity in fact what they do use it the glp1 as a vehicle to enter into the hypothalamus then dexamethasone acts centrally to reduce the appetite so it can in in fact any of its hypothalamic inflammation without having an effect on the bones or insulin sensitivity resistance so these are just animal models but not been uh, in no human trials yet so glucagon now we know that glucagon is uh, is very counterintuitive when you think about glucagon as a treatment for type 2 diabetes we all know that it increases uh, hepatic glucose production and primarily used for hypoglycemia so how can we use it for treatment of diabetes uh Glucagon has another unique effect, particularly in patients with hyperglycemia. It can is an important insulin secretor in insulin secretion. It has a central effect, decreases appetite, increases energy expenditure, and it particularly in the liver increases free fatty acid oxidation and decreases liver fat, and also has effect on gastric motility and decreases increases hep- amino acid uptake, which also 
contributes to systemic insulin resistance. So combined GLP-1 and GIP with glucagon with another novel metabolic effect in addition to GLP effect on adipose tissue itself. So it's strange, both glucagon agonists and antagonists are being developed for type 2, type 3, not type 2. We are, in fact, doing a trial with glucagon antagonists. But the problem with glucagon antagonists is that although they improve glycemic control, they increase liver fat. But they inhibit fatty acid oxidation, so they may never be approved. There's one part being tried earlier, which is the company stopped uh, pursuing any further because of the same side of the effect on hepatic toxicity. Okay, so this is the triple agonist being tried by started treatment and going through trial phase with Eli Lilly compound, which acts in both GLP, GIP, and glucagon. Because the theory is that the GIP works on the adipose tissue, works in adipose tissue insulin sensitivity, it also works on central nervous system, and eyelids, you know, improve insulin secretion. GLP1 again works on the CNS, decreasing appetite, and glucagon, as I just mentioned, increases energy expenditure, increases insulin secretion, and, and the effect of GLP and GIP1 upsets this hyperglycemic effect of glucagon. So it you see upside the hypoglycemic effect, but you see the energy expenditure or the weight loss or the decreased caloric intake induced by glucagon. So this is the first trial of the triple agonist just been published in Lancet, and but the combined prior this compound triple like GLP, GIP, and glucagon in patient type two diabetes phase one B study, and uh, showing that uh, this is the small study, but it's showing that here the the decline in the hemoglobin A1C, change in hemoglobin A1C about 1.5%. Uh, the body weight decreased by about um, 9%. And here, but the most important effect was on lipid profile. You should see that dual aggregate actually increases LDL, where you see a such 30% decrease in declined plasma LDL. And the triglyceride, you see almost 40% decline in triglyceride plasma triglyceride, and also decreases systolic blood pressure. So the triple agonists, uh, we do not have big trials in type 2 diabetes patient yet. So you know that we will find out what is the metabolic effect of this drug. But it does improve glycemic control and body weight for three, you know, over three months. And clearly, it improves lipid profiles. So we felt that this drug will have a potential fat mark. Uh, utility in treatment of particular patient NAFLD or NASH. So to summarize, uh, GLP-1 agonists improve glycemic control and reduce body weight without hypoglycemia. And so phase three studies already shown that um, this agonist shows promising results in glycemic control and weight loss. And so far, has the, I believe is the most potent agent still available moment, which lowers the A1C by 2.4% and weight loss by about 20%. I think only the bariatric surgery will be the metabolic effect of this particular compound. And um, although we expected that the adversity would be less than GLP-1 agonist, but it's similar, but you see much greater weight loss and glycemic control. And however, the long-term data, there's a study going on, such a better cardiovascular outcome for surpass CBOD. The results will come out in about two years, but preliminary data has shown that it's kind of neutral and has favorable effect on cardiovascular risk factors. So you expect at least to be neutral or better superior in terms of cardiovascular outcome compared to other GLP-1 agonists. So I think this class of medication in the future, several um, this multi multi agonist uh, polyagonist, single molecule polyagonists, we'll see a lot of them in future, and they will have uh, a role in for treatment of diabetes, obesity, and other, several other diseases too. I think that's the last slide. Uh, I'll stop for any questions.